So what do you think are going to be the policy priorities for Trudeau in this Indo-Pacific uh, uh, summit, APEC? Well, one of the biggest things that he's going to have to do is try to make himself relevant. I mean, given the difficulties that we faced with China, given the fact that, of course, even though India is not participating at APEC, but everyone will be aware of the very uh, bad relationship that has now developed between India and Canada, I think that probably just trying to tread water and show that he is, in fact, relevant to the region is going to be the major driving feature for what he'll be trying to achieve. That was one of my questions to you in this conversation today. The fact that Canada is heading to this APEC summit and the fact that Canada does not have a bilateral summit with China. We know that Modi is not present at the summit, so obviously there is no meeting with that Prime Minister of, of India. But where does it leave Canada when it doesn't have meetings with the two giants in Asia? Well, that's what I was saying. It doesn't leave us anywhere. I mean, I, the biggest problem that we face is that we haven't had a serious uh, Indo-Pacific strategy. Yes, we have a formalized strategy, but in terms of the types of politics, the type of interactions, the way that you make yourself relevant to others, uh, we are missing in action on this. And I think the fact that we have none of the major meetings with any of the important uh, players at this meeting just underlines that even more so. But the fact that the summit comes one year after the Liberal government themselves launched, you know, a $2.3 billion Indo-Pacific strategy, what do you make of the strategy and the progress done in that front or no progress at all? No, it's no progress at all. I mean, you look at the individual relationships. Um, Australia, because of our refusal to engage with them, of course, in terms of any types of meaningful defense procurement projects or anything on that line, is not going to be very interested to talk to, to Canada. Canada, of course, refused to sell any natural gas to, to, to the region, even though people know that that's going to be a major strategic requirement moving into it forward, uh, given the tensions with China. And so you look at the major needs of what the, the member states want or may, uh, member economies, because remember, we use that to allow Hong Kong and Taiwan to be there. Um, what do we have to offer? And, and again, it's, it's almost nothing, not mm -hmm. even any tokenism in, in this particular regards. And of course, all eyes on that face-to-face -face meeting between Biden and Xi Jinping. And of course, they are there to diffuse global tensions apart from tensions within these two nations themselves. But let me ask you this. If relations between China and the U.S. were to improve, become better, where does that leave Canada? It will continue to leave us out in the uh, out in the cold for the simple reason. How do we address the issues in terms that are driving the Canada uh, China divide? I mean, remember the uh, at the heart of it is the accusations of Chinese interference in our electoral system. Right. So better relationships between the Americans and the Chinese, if anything, makes it more problematic for us to address that. How do you how do you turn to a United States and say, oh, by the way, they're still interfering badly with us, and we like you to get harsher with them when you've just given up the very serious political capital to get better. So if anything, a, a better American-Chinese relationship will hurt our ability to do anything with China. Indeed, we leave it at that for now. Dr. Rob Hubert, political science professor and fellow at the Canadian Global Affairs Institute, thank you for your time.